Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from around the world. Welcome back to Creation Conversations. It's great to have you with us, and it's great to see people watching already and some people in the chat already. Uh, we've got a, another great topic for you, which is sort of built off of a, a program we did a couple of weeks ago about camouflage, right? But then thinking, well, what about some of the defense tactics that we see in animals, things like the bombardier beetle and stuff like that. So John will introduce the topic because it's actually sprung off of a question that was sent in as a comment uh, on one of our videos, but I'll let him explain that a little bit later. But we do have almost the full team. I'm, of course, here with Dr. Glenn Wilson, who's yep. in person with me here in the United mm -hmm. States. We've got John Mackay and Dr. Diane Eager and Craig, who are all in Australia. And uh, we're minusing Sam, but that's all right. I'm sure he'll be back in the future. But um, he was just unable to join us this week. Well, it's uh, it's been a fairly busy week for us. Yes, here it's in, been busy. Here, and it's not going to slow down anytime soon. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got another, at least another three things that we're doing over the next mm -hmm. few days. So uh, we're looking forward to doing that. And we'll bring you some updates uh, about that in a moment. But before we get on to the ministry reports, I just wanted to show a rather interesting little tweet that was sent out basically one day five years and one day ago um why is it interesting well let's have a look and see who it is greta thunberg who is of course the outspoken um climate change activist who've said some rather interesting things over the years including things like how dare you and so on and so forth um we've covered her as part of our fire and ice program as well but here's greta thunberg with a tweet well do you notice the date there the 21st of june 2018. Now, on the 21st of June 2018, um, it was very hot. I know that because it was just a couple of weeks before I flew over to Australia uh, to spend uh, about three months in Australia with John, and we were on a family holiday, and it was extraordinarily warm. We were hitting nearly 30 degrees and getting sunburn and all sorts. So it's interesting that she put out this post, and um, a top climate scientist is warning that climate change will wipe out all of humanity unless we mm. stop using fossil fuels mm. over the next five years. Well, the Bible says a few interesting things. First and foremost, it says to test all things. And um, so let's do a test. I mean, five years is not that long in the grand scheme of things. So we've waited five years. That brings us to basically yesterday. Um, and then we can test the prediction Oh, the Bible also says something interesting about false prophets, because if you prophesy things in God's name and they don't come true, then not only are you a false prophet, you're a false prophet um, using God's name in vain. And the Old Testament has some rather severe uh, dealings with false prophets. But let's have a look at what Greta Thunberg has said. Five years to stop using fossil fuels or all of humanity will be wiped out. Well, as Craig pointed out, over the last five years, if anything, we've increased using fossil fuels. Um, in fact, we've increased using fossil fuels, uh, particularly over the last two years because of the whole Russia in Ukraine war, and uh, we've had to turn to gathering fossil fuels from elsewhere and using it even more and turning to some of our own supplies. So if anything, over the last five years, we've increased using fossil fuels. And um, I mean, I'm here with Glenn and you're real. I'm, I think You're I am. Alive. I, I, Still I human. feel like I'm real. All right. And we had a great church service. A couple it of days was ago. full of that people was full that of are people. still so real. Humanity is still with us. Uh, we've increased fossil fuels. And so really the top climate scientist, uh, Greta Thunberg doesn't name here, but uh, by sharing this, we can certainly see that uh, she's also making this prediction. I'm sorry, but they are false prophets, just as false as Prince Charles, now King Charles, who said, we've got 100 months before we risk catastrophic climate change. And 100 months since he made that statement took us to 2017. And we're yet to see any catastrophic climate change. So it's an interesting little um, comment. And of course, we get asked to deal with the topic of climate change more than any other topic, really. Um, so uh, go and check out our programs on climate change, both on Creation Conversations, as well as Fire and Ice and some of the other programs on uh, creationresearchlive.com. And Maybe, it would be nice if it would warm up a little bit more so we can swim in our pool. Well, well right? indeed, yeah, we've, we've had to leave that for a week because it's been cold and wet here the last few <laughs> days. But, John, I also understand it's pretty chilly where you are, so why don't we hand over to you if you have any comments on that last Greta Thunberg tweet and then give us your ministry report. Okay, it's certainly true where I am, even in Queensland. It was really cold yesterday, but nowhere near as cold as my friends in Castlemaine 
who wrote up about how even the dog didn't want to go outside <laughs> and cold and wet and snowing. So they can have it. I've had all the snow I wanted when I climbed up that, that big mountain outside of Hobart many, many years ago, put my hand in the white stuff and I started to build a snowman and I thought, this is ridiculous. This stuff kills. So <laughs> climate change, no, we still got snow on the mountains outside of Hobart. We still got it in Castlemaine. And the climate is pretty much upsy downsy, upsy downsy, yeah. continuing on the same trend. So Greta, sorry, you've got it wrong. Time to apologize and turn back to the truth. Uh, in terms of truth, we, we've had some wonderful reminders in the last couple of days. You don't need to read this, but I'll hold it up. It's a very aged set of newspaper cuttings. That's a reminder of two things. It's first of all, all about a debate challenge. A clergyman had attacked a local science teacher who had been trying to organize a debate in the town involving me, Ken Ham, etc. cetera. Uh, this is in the early days, back in the 1980s, and the clergyman just scathingly tears apart or tries to this teacher and the thing, the newfangled thing called creationism or creation science. Now, the tragedy was it wasn't the scientist attacking the science teacher. It wasn't a religious teacher putting on the debate. It was a clergyman attacking the belief in biblical creation. Now, mm -hmm. at that time, I had just finished organizing creation science as a group. What do I mean by that? I'd uh, been teaching in Australia's leading college, Brisbane Grammar School, and in the science department. And a couple of us decided to try and find out, could we find any other teachers who would stand behind a new program I developed called How Do We Know What We Know in the First Place? Uh, a unit for teaching science so that kids would learn to think. And creation versus evolution was one of the examples. Now, as part of that, I contacted all the Christians that I could find out about, including a young man who worked in a school at Dolby, whose name was Ken Hare. Now, it would be he and I who went on to form what's become known as creationism or creation science in Australia. And that's why this looks so, so, well, you know how newspaper goes, that sort of nice yellowy color. Uh, that's a long ago reminder. And as the teacher said, I challenged the clergyman back and I never heard from him ever again. Well, the tragedy is not much has changed. It is sadly still the clergymen who are attacking creationism yeah. uh, as, as a sort of significant minority of people out there, uh, not the scientists. I mean, that's what Dr. Glenn has been all his life. That's yes. what Craig has been all his life. I've been involved in science education and science research, and that's been the majority of my life. The interesting thing is the Bible says test everything, and that mm -hmm. should be the theme of all scientists and all clergymen. So, guys, mm -hmm. get your act together because you can come and visit us at the other thing I've been doing. I bought in a nice little fossil. Now, Joe, you recognize that before. I do recognize it. That is the uh, original dinosaur tooth that led on to the sort of naming of dinosaurs um, found by, well, it's contested who exactly found it. It was either Gideon Mantell or his wife, Mary Ann Mantell. I suspect it was Mary Ann, um, but it's the, the original iguanodon teeth. It's the one we talked about this morning Indeed, on, the on the radio. Yeah, that's right. In fact, to add a bit more gossip to the story, if you uh, look at the history books, then according to Gideon, his wife found it first. That's while they were still married. After they were divorced, he changed the story. Why did they get divorced? Well, he lost so much money. Just he, he actually was a doctor and he used to fix bones and get paid for it. Then he got sidetracked by digging up bones and didn't get paid for it. So the whole marriage fell apart, sadly. And all of a sudden, Mary Mantell is not credited with standing outside a patient's house and picking up this stone from the nearby quarry and uh, and actually get, getting the first of our original dinosaur finds because Gideon Mantell is definitely on record as saying, this is the tooth of a lizard, but a bigger lizard than we've ever seen before. Now, why am I doing it? Because I'm just finishing off our dinosaurs, the monsters God made display for our new museum opening on October, sorry, July 
the 29th and 30th. So we're down to the five weeks to go. We're up to the history bit. So Gideon Mantell features, Mrs. Mantell features, and Richard Owen features because he invented the word dinosaur based on at least four specimens, mostly uh, derived from Gideon Mantell's collection because Owen sort of rescued him financially a bit by buying them. But you see, the attitude is interesting. Uh, Sir Richard Owen was convinced that dinosaurs, which used to be called dragons, were the monsters God made. Hence the theme of our historically accurate, totally tested um, information on dinosaurs. So those of you in South, Southeast Queensland, come along October 29th, 30th, and join us for a spectacular Monsters God Made, where you'll find out things about T-Rex and its diet you never knew until you turned up. October 29th, 30th, go to creationresearch.net, click on the sign-in sheet because you have to sign up to actually uh, get in. Limited space. Back to you, uh, uh, Joseph. All right, great stuff. Thanks for that, John. Well, we're going to go over to Diane next for her ministry report, which also includes uh, some of the evidence news, um, which went out recently. Uh, about, as we were just chatting about the evidence news, it turns out that we have the ability here in the United States to bring some sort of visual aids. We're going to bring a visual aid a visual if aid. it well, works out. Why don't you swell. go get the visual aid down there and, and see what... Glenn's got to wrestle with a wild animal for a moment. Uh, in the meantime, Diane, um, why don't you give us a, a, a background to the evidence news and remind people how they can sign up to it before we go to our first evidence news topic. Yes, we sent out a newsletter this week. Uh, if you're on our mailing list, that's our electronic mailing list, uh, you would have got a copy of that. Uh, if you would like to get it, you can just go to our main website and uh, sign up for it there. It is free. It just comes out as an email uh, every few weeks, and it will include reports of uh, what we've been doing. So you'll hear about the exciting things that we've got going uh, with the uh, Brisbane Museum and uh, a bit more about the, the open day with some a uh, couple of nice pictures of uh, some of the things that have been um, gathered together for that, uh, mm -hmm. including some fabulous dinosaur casts. Uh, and then we also have a watching brief of uh, what's been reported in the scientific news, and we pick a couple of them that have relevance to um, to our uh, topic of creation, of God's creation and creation and evolution, and we, we write those up and help people to see how they can look at these scientific reports which are usually presented as here is some wonderful evidence for evolution, when in fact what it is is actual evidence for uh, the biblical history of the world of creation and uh, followed by uh, degeneration uh, as is reported in the Bible and just help people to see things from that point of view and understand. And quite often it will make more sense if you look at it through biblical glasses, as it were, rather than Darwin's and, glasses. And so speaking we of which, we've got our first ever... Um, uh, sort of will, we'll bring it into the camera. Let's this put will lead to... into exactly what you're talking about. So we've got a um, yes, hmm. a chicken just here. A uh, quite a young young chicken. Young chicken, but yes. look what it's got on its legs. Let's hold its legs up to the camera here. Can you see what's on its legs just here? Yes, yeah, so that, that's very scaly yes. bit. But then there's the feathers. So it's got feathery feet. Hmm. As a, as a few different types of chickens do. Now, Diane, what has this got to do with the evidence news? Uh, well, this was a story that was uh, in, in evidence news this week, and may, maybe if we go to my slides. Uh, and, uh, and this was uh, a story about turning chicken scales to feathers. Now, um, most chickens actually have scales, on their legs and their and their feet, um, but as you just saw, some of them do have uh, feathers, and we, we'll come to that. And uh, so, some scientists were actually able to take a chicken breed and get it to produce feathers where it would normally have scales. Uh, and uh, so, what they did is they uh, stimulated a, a gene with the unlikely name of Sonic Hedgehog. Now, uh, Sam, unfortunately, has not been able to come. He's, he's our expert 
in uh, all things uh, electronic and video and uh, internet. And I was going to ask him uh, what he knew about Sonic Hedgehog because apparently Sonic Hedgehog, Sonic the Hedgehog was a character in a video game. Uh, I don't remember that, but uh, 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 back in the 1990s, when we first discovered particular genes and actually uh, worked out how to uh, sequence them, uh, genes were given all sorts of strange names because um, these, this research was done by a lot of young guys uh, who sat in the back rooms while the uh, scientific, um, some of this was quite tedious sort of research. And uh, so we ended up with gene names like Lunatic Fringe and Head Case and Tin Man and Superman. Um, these days we give genes names like TP53 and APOE because the, um, the, the regulators of naming things in the scientific world decided, well, we can't do that because now that we've discovered these genes, some of them have uh, homologues in human uh, genes and some of them are related to human genes and you really can't sit down and tell somebody well you've got a problem with your lunatic fringe gene uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, so but unfortunately once they were officially um, named in a scientific report they had to stick and so mm. we're stuck with uh, sonic hedgehog genes <laughs> And, uh, uh, but anyway, that's an interesting backstory. But back to the, the story here, uh, we've known about this particular gene for a long time. And the, uh, this group of scientists uh, were able to stimulate this gene um, using a chemical stimulant in chicken embryos. And the chickens, uh, which were from a breed that has scaly legs and scaly feet, developed feathers on their legs. Uh, where they would normally have scales, and so, uh, uh, and they they did it. Um, it it did actually work. Uh, if I can just get the slide to advance, here we are. Um, the normal chicken leg up the top there with uh, scaly legs and scaly feet, and the uh, chickens that uh, they had uh, done this to while they were still in the egg. Uh, after uh, stimulating this particular gene, which is usually abbreviated as SHH there. And sure enough, they did were, were hatched out. When they hatched out, they had um, these tiny little um, feathery sort of uh, um, feathers, uh, just like a, a young chicken. And as the chickens grew up, um, they did actually develop into uh, more adult type feathers. So they really did do it. Uh, it, it worked. But of course, this um, sort of thing is invariably uh, presented as evidence for evolution, and so this was their um, this was uh, their statement in one of the um, briefs that uh, the University of Geneva their press report for the general public. Mm -hmm. Our results indicate that an evolutionary leap from scales to feathers. Uh, which is the usual story about how feathers develop from reptilian creatures, uh, mainly dinosaurs. Uh, an evolutionary leap from scales to feathers does not require large changes in genome composition or expression. Instead, a transient chain in the change in the expression of one gene, SHH or sonic hedgehog, can produce a cascade of developmental events use leading to the formation of feathers instead of scales. Well, that sounds like a good story. Uh, but is this an evolutionary leap? Uh, well, no, it's not. And I've written there no twice because, in fact, there are two good reasons that this is not an evolutionary leap. Um, the first one is sonic hedgehog genes do not actually produce new genes. It's just a gene activator. Uh, one of the things that we're learning from the genome revolution over the last couple of decades is that um, how genes are regulated, that is how they are turned on and off, how long they are turned on for and how they interact with other genes is just as important as the content, as the content of the actual structural genes that, that make up our bodies and the functional genes. Uh, we're learning about that. And so these, this particular gene, Sonic Hedgehog, um, it is a gene organizer. It's very important in embryonic development in terms of organizing 
um, which parts of the body are built where. Uh, a bit like the, um, if you imagine the, uh, the site manager on the building site will tell the particular tradesman, yes, you know, you go and build this thing here, you go and build that thing here. And the tradesman will have the knowledge and the components in all, all ready to do that. Uh, so that's what this gene is like. It's a gene regulator and a gene organizer. It doesn't actually produce any new genes. So this is not an evolutionary process because chickens already have the, the genes for uh, feather structure um, built in there. Uh, stimulating sonic hedgehog is not going to um, produce an evolutionary type change. And of course, the other thing is, well, you've just seen the evidence with the real live evidence. I, um, that, that I wasn't anticipating that. That was an extra bonus. Uh, some chicken breeds are actually known to have feathers on their legs and feet. In fact, uh, um, poultry breeding, uh, people breed chickens for their appearance uh, as much as for their uh, egg laying and, and their, um, their, their meat quality. And uh, you get uh, all sorts of breeds of chicken that do have uh, feathers on their feet. So definitely not evolution. Um, and this is something we come across a lot in the scientific reports. Uh, things that are not evolution are claimed to be evolution. It's all just keeping that word, any change is evolution, keeping that word front and centre in people's minds. There's lots of change going on in the biological world. Some of it happens naturally. Some of it is induced by scientists who fiddle with genes these days. Uh, none of it's evolution. Lots of change, no evolution. Now, our other story uh, was something completely different. Um, this was a uh, human history story about Paleolithic pitch. Now, by pitch, we mean sort of hard, black hard tarry sort of stuff and it's about a particular type of pitch called birch tar which is also sometimes called birch bark pitch and uh, it's claimed to be the oldest synthetic substance made by human early humans because you do actually find it in so-called caveman sites or uh, paleolithic sites and uh, it's actually found in Neanderthal sites as well. And it's this sort of very uh, hard um, black tarry sort of substance. And uh, it's, it's derived from burning uh, tree bark and in particular birch tree bark in, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and you can actually make it. Um, and people have found this stuff in these archaeological sites uh, and they've uh, tried to... Um, uh, reproduce it and, and it works. So they worked out how you can do this. You you actually just need to get um, birch uh, tree bark and burn it uh, in a campfire uh, right with stones and you will get a sort of black tarry substance forming on these stones. And it was always assumed that uh, this was something that was accidentally discovered uh, when people lit campfires and so oh this, this is useful stuff it is very useful stuff it's uh, used as glue in a very strong glue in um, ancient tools uh, it also has a waterproof um, function and it, it's uh, got an uh, antimicrobial properties as well so very useful stuff this tree bark and so some scientists having looked at this uh, stuff in Neanderthal sites looked at how how it can be made and uh, did a, a chemical study of it. And so they, they deliberately made some. So they, they did an experiment where they uh, looked at making this and they made it by that method uh, that uh, we've just seen there with burning it in a campfire. Uh, but there is also another way of making this sort of uh, birch tar or, or tree bark tar. Uh, which actually does a better job, makes a, a purer sort of uh, substance. And that is uh, to uh, use what's called a below ground method where you burn the uh, tree bark in a confined space so that you've got restricted flow of air, so a restricted oxygen flow, uh, and you need to control the, the heat of the fire. So this does require a lot of plan and purpose uh, but it does produce a particularly good type of, um, uh, of tar or uh, black pitch. 
And so some scientists decided they would um, produce uh, tar by these different methods and compare the stuff that they found in the Neanderthal sites with modern day um, tar that they that you can just make using either either of these methods. And they discovered that the Neanderthals were actually producing the uh, uh, the birch tar that fitted with the um, that more complicated method. And uh, this was reported in a few different uh, scientific news sites. Uh, one of them is called Interesting Engineering. Uh, has some interesting stories um, about uh, technology, both new and uh, ancient. And they said, well, this study challenges our perception of human intelligence and enhances our understanding of Neanderthals. It emphasizes that not only modern people can produce complicated manufacturing processes and material synthesis. In other words, it's yet more affirmation that Neanderthals were extremely intelligent, sophisticated, creative people because they were fully human. They are not a different species and they are certainly not um, human beings evolving from ape-like creatures. Uh, now, we shouldn't be surprised that you can find the evidence of sophisticated engineering in, um, in these so-called ancient archaeological sites because Think of who the human, think of who both the Neanderthals, think of their, um, where they came from. They are the descendants of the people who came from the Tower of Babel, who were so sophisticated and clever, God said, well, if I let them go, there's no stopping them as to what they can do. And of course, those people are the descendants of Noah and his three sons who built the ark, which was covered in pitch. Now, where did they get the pitch from? Well, I think the uh, the memories of that that technology would have been passed down, and then after the Tower of Babel, they were um, uh, some people still had that creative uh, ability and the memories of this technology. So again, all of these things are much better explained if you look at the world and the history of the world through the biblical point of view. Uh, so uh, if you uh, do get our newsletter, you would have got um, a couple of other interesting things. There was a good quote about flood fossils on the Isle of Wight and some good news about our Brisbane Museum. If you don't get the newsletter, uh, you can sign up for it. All those science reports do get archived as individual items, so you don't need to know when the newsletter was sent out. You can just do a keyword search and look for things like Paleolithic pitch or uh, chicken feathers, and the items will come up separately. So if we can come back to us now, uh, <clears throat> if uh, any yep. of the others would like to uh, ask questions or add to uh, what we've done there. Diane, just a just a comment on the pitch. <clears throat> Obviously, yeah. Noah is pre-flood, and mm. most pitch is found in the ground now. Hence, we are in a post-flood world, and that confuses some people. So, Noah learned to manufacture pitch, probably mm. by stacking up pine trees or birch trees, covering them with dirt, the same way the Europeans did thousands of years after that, and yeah. starting a fire at one end, and you get carbon-rich pitch is actually pushed out of the tree end and you can scrape it off and paint your boat with it. So that is a very effective technology that Noah would have had to invent because he did not get pitch by distilling oil or anything that was found in the ground. As opposed to the people of Babel, if you go to Babel today, you'll find not too far from the ruins are some of the biggest open pitch deposits in the world, still by yeah. down by the river. So they would have scooped up pine resins and that that had been naturally <clears throat> distilled under the ground up during the flood and since then. And, of course, the Neanderthals are descendants both of Noah and his technology and the people of Babel who used the pitch to glue all their bricks together, right? Mm. So they had high technology and they weren't the uh, sort of primitive, degenerate, half-ape, half-man that people think they are. Uh, good mm -hmm. reports, really worth uh, um, getting there. Uh, back to you, Joe. 
Well, before we go on to Glenn for his um, <clears throat> ministry report, I just want to say that for some reason our software is not working. Uh, so we currently cannot see any of the live chat, which is coming in on YouTube. Uh, I've tried posting something on uh, through our software onto YouTube into the live chat, and we've also not been able to do that however we've got you up in front of us and we can see the live chat on youtube itself so don't worry we've got your questions keep your questions coming in and uh, mm. after um we've we've moved on a little bit uh, and gone into our main <laughs> topic we'll have a break for questions and we'll come across to those no problem um, but do keep those questions and those comments coming in and thank you for all of your donations so far we'll go through those in a moment but craig over to you for your ministry report Thanks, Joe. Uh, first of all, during the week, I got this uh, coelacanth sculpture. It's more a sculpture than it is a, a cast, although it's based off the original uh, coelacanth fossil. So that'll be useful probably for ministry more so than display at the museum uh, necessarily. So I'll be taking that around and hope to get a, a, a modern coelacanth model as well. Uh, the coelacanth, of course, is an interesting story in that it was in the early decades of evolutionary teaching, supposed evidence of fish growing legs until they found one swimming around in the ocean in the 1930s. So that's, um, that's a good addition to the museum. And also uh, during the week, I've com pretty well completed my polished straight tree model if uh, joe would like to put that up on the screen i'm afraid that it's popped off of the screen um craig so you will need oh. to put it back up again on 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 your powerpoint if you just share your screen again and bring it up that'll be there okay i think that's that's so what you're doing right? that craig just a reminder that this is based on the tree that i actually excavated in newcastle where we it went from one coal seam through heaps of coal seams great stuff well done tell us more yeah, okay, so that, that exactly what you just said. Um, it's a coalified uh, tree going through uh, various layers and there's a few bits of coal layers there. And on your advice, John, as well, we've uh, put a few uh, shells and, and, and sea creature fossils throughout, which are also found in uh, polystrate tree areas. So, yeah, that's going to be powerful evidence. I've still got to get a sign put together for it, but I'm, I'm thinking about making it something like polystrate trees, devastating evidence against millions of years, something like that. And, um, uh, yeah, so I'm an expert fiberglasser now. Look at that. <laughs> that it. Yeah, most impressive. Yeah, it is very well done. Just, just those, don't ask me to repair your boat, okay? Uh, yeah. and for, those, you, for those who didn't safe. get it, that, what sort of tree is that, Craig? That, that is a pine tree. That's a real pine tree and you've coalified it sort of artificially. But the yes. key factor is that if that had grown there and they're slowly buried, it would not last because pine is softwood and all those marine layers and water-based layers would uh, just rot it totally. Yeah, well, literally, uh, yeah, the pine trees start to rot. Most pine trees, not a, not all of them, but uh, most pine trees start to rot with within one or two two years completely start falling apart so there's no way they'd last the years required mm -hmm. for those layers to form in, and in we know that this situation. is one of them because this is an australian pine tree a southern conifer and they are softwood and they don't uh, survive submersion in water neither will they grow in water mm -hmm. and they'll grow nearby but not in the water i uh, th th yeah well th this actual model is based on a um a radiata pine but um, yeah, no doubt the the pine trees that you've got in the real um, situations in Australia are probably the southern pines. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, that that's the only slide for that point, Joe. If you want to come back to me, and uh, that's pretty well what I've been doing. Great stuff. Thanks for that. Um, right. Well, let's move on to our um, to our main topic. But before we do, we've just had a couple of quick questions, which we'll have our big question answer time after our main topic. But this is actually relevant specifically to Diane about the um, 
evidence news report. So uh, we have got a couple of questions that have come in about that, and we'll deal with the rest of those going forward. But the first question here, uh, Diane, is do you think it's more likely that the original chicken kind had feathers on their left legs and some have just lost that or vice versa? Uh, no, I think it's more likely that they had scales on their legs. Um, the, uh, it's not terribly functional for them to have feathers on their feet. <laughs> uh, in fact, if you look at the chicken breeding sites, the chickens with feathers on their feet usually have require sort of special, a uh, special care. Um, but, uh, the, mm -hmm. the point is that chickens, every cell in a chicken's body has all of the genes necessary to make feathers. It's just, they get activated in the right places. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. so the, uh, the original chicken kind, I, I would say, had scaly feet and and, and scaly legs. And uh, what's happened is that the in the breeds that have feathers, which look pretty, um, but they're not necessarily functional, are <laughs> um, uh, just so where what, the genes have been activated in the uh, in, in an unusual place. Yes. What, what Diane you're referring to is when this one was real little chick. We had to clean the poop up off of its feet every day that sticks yes. to the feathers because mm. then it will cause diseases on the feet. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's not something that would naturally somebody's going to go along there cleaning them up for them every day. Um, so, yeah, it's a disadvantage. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to our um, main program now, which is, of course, about sort of defense tactics that are often seen in animals today. And where do they fit into a very good world or a very biblical perspective? So, John, why don't we go over to you first to introduce the topic and then we'll go to Diane and then we'll go to Craig and then we'll uh, do a good question answer session. So, John, over okay. to you. Thanks, Joe. Um, and yes, I totally agree with you, Glenn. I've read, read chickens all my life and the ones with the feathery feet do get feet diseases from yes. their poop. In mm -hmm. fact, throwing a, an offbeat comment, Joe and I were talking about dinosaur poop versus chicken <laughs> poop. And if they're supposed to be related, there should be a distinct connection and there's quite a marked difference. But that's, that's for another question. Uh, the subject today comes from a question that was sent in after a couple of weeks ago. And we try to help people with their questions in two ways. One, if we can show the research about the information we give, and two, to put it in a biblical perspective. Now, we are becoming either famous and notorious, take your pick, for stressing the biblical picture. God made everything very good, Genesis 1 and 2. Then sin came in, and things have headed downhill since then. Now, I'm going to quote a verse out of the book of Romans because some of the people mentioned in this old article here struggle in their pre-creation science days with the existence of the things that are regarded as bad. And why would God make bad things? Why would he make explosive things? Why would he make things that could be used for defense? Why would he make all of that? And, 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 and in reality, you have to get a biblical perspective first. So I love the Apostle Paul, who God used mightily to take all of the Old Testament and summarize it and put it in the context that the creator became the savior, lived on earth, and he did it for this reason and that reason, etc. So can I encourage you to pick up a book called Romans sometimes, which, well, I've got to be honest, it shows Paul's background because the arguments are so tight, you not only can't defeat them, you have trouble sometimes following the tight legal arguments. So Romans 1 and 2 is all about creation. Romans 2 and 3 is all about how sin has affected the creation. And yes, in those three chapters, no apologies, Paul, courtesy of the Holy Spirit, reminds us how God hates homosexuality and homosexuality is not a cause of sin, it's a consequence of men rebelling against God. Sorry for being politically incorrect, but truth often always is. Then by the time you get from chapter 3, where all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, which you think of in terms of people, we then get up to Romans chapter 8, where when you're halfway through it to two-thirds of the way through it, Paul says, we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together till now. Not popular. Some churches want the whole world to be getting better and better till Jesus comes. 
the Apostle Paul says, no, even in his day, the whole creation groans. Now, that was a thing that eventually became very helpful to some of the professors we were reaching out to in the early days who get mentioned in this ancient reminder that was just sent to me through the post yesterday, and we'll go straight into our history files. Why? Because you can't assume that what you see around you is normal. Paul says it's affected by sin. It's degraded by sin. It's gone downhill. It used to be up there. So don't start thinking about what God created the bombardier beetle to blow up the faces of spiders who are sneaking up behind it to kill it. He says wrong perspective. In the beginning, everything was very good. That's why Paul starts Romans with creation. He has to remind you of the legal basis for the whole of the New Testament gospel is God made everything good. We made it bad. And look, by the time you get past sin and salvation, even in this world, we are all subject to corruption. I spent a week in hospital a little while ago, not because the world is good, but because my body is falling apart. That's the reality. So here's the question that came in. Since the bombardier beetle has a tremendous mechanism, and if you want to know about mechanisms, go to Professor Andy McIntosh's work. It's brilliant, inventing new sort of pumps and things like that based on the bombardier beetle because the design is so brilliant. But when something sneaks up behind it, it got the ability to eject two streams of liquid that mix and then a fraction of a second later, boom! And the animal is frightened to death if not actually sent right to death. Um, why would God create an explosive weapon? Of course, we did have some funny suggestions from people like, well, those people who come from Tasmania who talked about flavoured flatulence that might have other good uses, but we may not get there. But Diane certainly would like to bring our attention to some of the things that look as if they're done for defence or attack and what they could have been for in a very good world. Diane, take it away. Uh, well, going back to the bombardier beetle, we, we have to remember that um, you, you need to put things in their, in their context. And the bombardier beetle, um, you've seen the studio sort of setups that uh, on uh, wildlife programs and na natural history programs. In reality, this is a tiny little beetle. It's a ground beetle. It lives on the ground. It lives on riverbanks and forest floors. So it lives in the leaf litter and the, um, and the grass. And so um, it uh, scuttles around. It's a tiny little beetle, uh, you know, less than half a centimetre um, in length, most of them. And how would they find one another? How would they communicate? Um, making a few loud noises and explosions is probably quite a good way of communicating if you live under the leaf litter and you want to find uh, other bombardier beetles. And they do tend to form uh, aggregations with each other. They're nocturnal, but during the day they will all gather together uh, and uh, in a sort of protective um, layer. And uh, so it could be useful for communication. It could be useful for finding mates. After all, uh, they have to reproduce and they have to find one another. So it's a quite a useful um, little mechanism. Now, there are lots of things that are considered these days to be uh, just for defence, um, just to uh, beat off uh, other uh, things that want to come and eat you. A classic case would be sharp teeth. And uh, in Australia, we have all sorts of dangerous animals. I do remember once when I was in England being introduced to uh, the neighbours of the fr friends that I was uh, staying with, and there had just been uh, a crocodile report, uh, a report of a crocodile um, attacking some uh, American tourists. And uh, I was introduced, this is our friend from Australia, and we talked about uh, things going on in Australia. And in the conversation, uh, the neighbour said, oh, well, your country is lethal. <laughs> so, um, so let's have a look at uh, a couple of those things and think, well, could they have had a function in the good world? What was that good world like? Um, so if we can go back to our slides. Um, there they are. There they are. Yes, if I can. Uh, this is a photo that I actually did take. Um, 
unfortunately, there was a very large, thick piece of glass between me and this fellow so mm -hmm. that his teeth were not going to be used to eat me. Um, but what do crocodiles eat? Uh, American tourists. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, if you go by the sensational news headlines that uh, my uh, English friend's neighbours heat uh, uh, read, um, everyone thinks that crocodiles just go around looking for things to eat and uh, they, therefore they have sharp teeth. Uh, for uh, for killing things. But uh, what do they eat? Well, this might be of interest to you, Glenn and, and Joseph, now that you're uh, in America with, with Glenn there. Uh, someone a while ago did a survey of what did the alligators in the uh, Everglades National Park in Florida, what did they eat? And they discovered that quite a few of the alligators had been eating fruit. And uh, they collected uh, diet information for other crocodilians, so alligators, crocodiles, um, gharials, uh, from around the world, having found this about the, um, the alligators in Florida. And uh, they discovered that uh, 13 crocodilian species uh, actually did have fruit in their diet. And, of course, the uh, interesting corollary of that is that... Um, well, what happens when an animal eats fruit? Uh, well, yes, the uh, animal will digest the, the flesh of the fruit. Sometimes they will digest the seed that's inside it as well. But sometimes the seed will actually pass right through the animal's digestive system and uh, come out the, uh, the back end. And the scientists who did this uh, study decided that we now have uh, a phenomenon called saurockery, which is uh, derived from a couple of words, saurus meaning reptile, ockery meaning seed dispersal. And we know that seeds are dispersed uh, by other animals eating or birds eating them, eating the fruit and depositing the seeds. And so uh, crocodilians have now joined the uh, seed dispersal business, um, or they always did. We've just discovered it. And uh, so... Uh, they uh, said that, well, here's something that offers a fertile ground for future research. That was meant to be a bit of a pun because what else comes out the back end? One of the advantages of having your seeds dispersed by being passed through an animal's uh, digestive system is that you also get uh, some fertilizer uh, added to it as well as the seed. Uh, when it's finally deposited out the uh, the back end. So don't think of crocodiles designed for killing things. Yes, they do that these days, but that is because the world has gone downhill. In the very good world where they didn't eat American tourists, uh, they were quite happy to eat fruit and their teeth are well designed for, uh, e for eating fruit as well as for eating other things. Um, John, you, you've had a bit more experience with crocodiles than I have because you live up north where the crocodiles are. Uh, where I live, it's too cold for them, so it's not a problem up here. Um, but, of course, the other thing that Australia is famous for is uh, sharks. So what do sharks eat? Well, they eat fish, divers and surfers. No, no, well, they do actually, uh, but not all that often. Right, mostly they eat fish but they also eat seaweed and sea grasses. And uh, that just sounds completely bizarre. How could you possibly have vegetarian sharks? Well, there've been a few interesting stories uh, recently. One of them is about a shark called the uh, bonnethead shark, uh, which lives in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and it has been found to eat seagrass. And there, uh, some scientists did uh, a quite detailed study on these. They actually captured some and kept them in a, a, a big uh, aquarium and they carefully monitored their diet and they deliberately fed them, uh, gave them seagrass to eat and then uh, studied them to see how well they were living and they were actually thriving uh, on e eating seagrass. Uh, now, this is actually only a very little shark what about really big ones? And I mean really, really big ones. What about Megalodon? Well, um, and this was a seriously big shark. It, uh, uh, this is a, a montage that, that I made showing you the uh, overall size of them, and we're not making it up. Um, here is one of our uh, 
exhibits at our Jurassic Ark site uh, based on a real fossil of a megalodon jaw with its teeth. Um, it's one of our good photo opportunities, but uh, let's go back to uh, megalodon sharks. What did they eat? Well, if you look at their teeth and don't just think of their overall size, uh, they're actually well designed for plant eating because they've got this serrated edge there. Uh, and as I said uh, recently, they've done a few studies on different sharks looking at their diet, and you can read about these in our fact file. So the bonnethead shark in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, you can read about that, but you can also read about whale sharks in Ningaloo Reef, which is a reef off northwestern Australia. And uh, a really interesting story we came across quite a few years ago uh, in Birmingham where there was a, a tropical nurse shark kept in an aquarium uh, which became ill and uh, needed some uh, veterinary attention because it, it got uh, it had uh, something caught in its um, in its jaw uh, and uh, after having this um, veterinary treatment um, to remove this um, a piece of metal that had got stuck in its jaw uh, when they were looking after it they had it in a, a big um, tank where there was also a turtle uh, and they fed the turtle uh, plant food because that's what turtles eat but the shark was discovered to be eating some of the turtles food and uh, it, it actually preferred the plant food than the uh, uh, than the uh, fish and the um, uh, protein the high protein food that it really needed in order to recover and they had to uh, in order to get it to eat um, uh, fish and uh, protein food for it to recover they had to hide it inside vegetables <laughs> uh, an interesting story there you can look that up uh, on our fact file uh, so sharks and crocodiles they were created for the good world they are now surviving in the fallen world uh, but uh, that's change but again it's not evolution the real history of the world is from good to bad to uh worse i'm afraid we're still in the worst there is salvation and glory at the end but in the biological world i'm afraid things are going downhill lots of change but no evolution if we can come back to us uh i'm sure uh, john and the others will have things to add uh to that story well craig's going to take over soon but it always hmm. reminds me of what i've you know being an animal uh, lover and keeper all my days the things that I've seen creatures eat. So my vegetarian chickens, if I forget to feed them, will go hunting mice. Now, mm. they don't have teeth, but boy, is that big, well-equipped along with wings that flap us like crazy to chase mice and tear them to pieces. Mm. Uh, normally, they'd eat grain and be calm and comfortable, and they blame John Mackay for turning them into carnivores. Uh, but they don't, they are not obligatory carnivores. Likewise, my dog with its big sharp teeth, and we've showed a clip uh, on this program of my dog who I discovered in you know, a big wolf type Alsatian cross. Uh, he loves chicken grain, right? We call it chook food in Australia. Chook's our sort of local slang for chicken. But uh, anyway, he will eat that all day, you know, and you can see it coming through like Diane says and I could go and plant some of it to get a good crop because he doesn't sort of chew up the food. Uh, it's already broken for him. So in most of the seeds, he will just digest them because they're broken, but there are some that aren't and they will pass all the way through and come out with a lovely pile of fertilizer. So God thought of every option for planting with self-fertilizing little pots and so you see the extremes, even in the pets and that, that you get. So those of you who have dogs, don't be afraid of giving them chook food, chicken food. They will love all of those things. And you will also see them eating grass, likewise cats. And we've also talked about how that is part of a design diet because they can't digest cellulose in the grass. <clears throat> Although we, if you've got a long memory, what we said it was for, it's to actually clean their guts out. So they need a good cleaning with the silica-rich uh, cellulose material in the grass that scrapes all their guts out and adds substance to their 
poop as it was. So, Craig, you've got some interesting film you've uh, taken of of uh, so something in Tasmania or in Queensland. I can't remember exactly where you filmed it, but it's a reminder of the change of functions uh, with time and degeneration. Take it away. Thanks, John. Well, just before I go on to that, uh, just regarding the dogs, uh, when I was doing some work at a hatchery in the Solomon Islands a few years ago, um, it was on a, on the island where the airport was near Gizo uh, in the western part of the Solomon Islands, and the island was very small. It was only basic, basically the length of the the run runway for the for the aeroplanes, and there was a dog on this yeah. island, and I asked the the owners what, what does it normally eat because I saw them uh, feeding it bananas, and they said oh, it only, only eats bananas, and I said how old was it, and they said well it's sixteen years old, and, and it only ever really eaten eaten bananas, so there's evidence there that a, a dog can mm. can live a vegetarian life and live a, a quite a long life. Just so, before you dive on, uh, Craig, Glenn also has a comment about seeds and. Yeah, well, one, I had a Labrador that preferred fruits. Um, we first noticed it when we thought the neighbor's kids were eating our strawberries, and we found out it was our dog, a Labrador. And then we found out it was eating our corn, and then it was our muscadines. We just had to put it in the bin. It would eat all of our fruit. We couldn't grow anything. Our pears, everything. It preferred <laughs> that over me. But one of the things I was going to add was that there's many uh, plants whose seeds require going through an animal's digestive system to break down the outside in order for it to germinate. So that's really clearly smartly designed by an intelligent designer. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Back to you, Craig. Yeah, there is another story too about um, shark, sharks. Uh, a shark in a, an aquarium in the UK actually uh, was was sick, and they put it in a turtle tank and fed it veg, vegetarian food that the turtle was eating. And then when they tried to reintroduce fish when the shark was better, it refused to them. They could only feed it lettuce and and other things like this. So that that was a, another interesting story. Um, so do you want to cover this now? Now that we've been on teeth rather than the giant stinging tree? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go for okay. it. Okay. Well, the Tasmanian devil is an interesting one. It's very uh, specific to to Tasmania, of course. I'll just go back to that. Um, it's, it's a marsupial. It's the largest carnivorous marsupial still left alive on the planet, the Tasmanian tiger being bigger but now most likely extinct. Mm -hmm. um, some people still think it's in existence the thylacine in remote areas of Tasmania but at this stage the Tasmanian devil is the, the the biggest one that we can still find and it grows up to about 80 centimeters long it's not particularly high but it's about the size of a, a small dog or a, a very very large cat and it's only really reported to be eating um, meat it's a it's a carnivore and it took me some finding on the internet to discover that it has actually been found to eat some vegetable matter so it will eat vegetable matter there was a scientific study done looking at the scats or the, the poop as you, you were calling it earlier where these guys have had vegetation in their poop um, they are related, in fact, to this creature, the tiger quoll. I'll just play this. We have played it before, but it just gives you another idea of a, an animal that's related to the Tasmanian devil, another marsupial called a tiger quoll. And I'll just move on. There's another one, the darker one. That's close to my home. That was actually a bit of roadkill, sadly, but gives mm. you an idea of them and some of the colour mm. variations. So it's a possibility that they are part of the same created kind. They are both in the Desurid family and they um, uh, look, look somewhat similar but are very different animals and are not known to interbreed. So perhaps they've got to the point where they um, have, you know, just won't breed because of behavioural uh, 
differences or, or perhaps because they're just um, uh, genetically varied that much that they won't do that, but uh, they are part of the same family. And uh, the tiger quail, the reason I raised that, it, it is well known to eat fruit. So this family of creatures, which are largely carnivorous in the modern world, do eat fruits as well, much the same as what we've been talking about. So there's a picture of a, a Tasmanian devil. They, they typically eat little birds, small marsupials, but usually dead things. They're very good at cleaning up virtually everything of an animal except teeth. So they'll, eat, they'll crunch through bones. They've got a jaw pressure that is pound for pound, kilo for kilo. It's uh, stronger than a wolf or a lion, very strong jaw pressure, and uh, will crunch through the bones and have an interesting um, feeding mechanism. So that's pretty well all I wanted to talk about. The devils, the, the group might like to if you want to come back to, to us, Joe, talk more about that. But that is a, an example of an animal that is only known to be carnivorous in the modern world, except they have reported it eating some vegetable matter as well. Mm -hmm. And, and I did have a, a, a mother of one of the students at a school that I was speaking to in Queensland last week raise the fact that, you know, isn't this evidence that... Um, when, when carnivorous animals, they have a different gut flora and all that sort of stuff. Isn't this evidence that God, she was a Christian, but that he had to recreate after the flood and, and create things so that they could eat meat and, and so on. And I think uh, some of the examples that we've given show, show that this isn't necessarily the case, that yes, there might be different gut floras in some of these creatures and they're probably passed on through the birth process as well. Um, but Diane would probably be able to comment mm -hmm. on on that a little bit more yeah Diane. yes that, that's true the um uh and <clears throat> there's probably been some degeneration uh in the in the gut it, it uh, you, you need a, a shorter gut to uh, digest animal food because it's already much more like um the, the food that we have so you need a more complex gut to uh to live on a a, a grass diet uh, which is a specialist vegetarian diet um and also we have to remember that in the general degeneration of the world, the plants have also degenerated. They're probably not as nutritious. So there, there would have been degeneration of um, digestive systems. There's probably been loss of some gut flora uh, in that they mm. fail to be passed on from generation to generation. Uh, so it's the whole picture is one of going downhill. It's, it's not of increasing complexity. Diane, could, I'd like to ask a question. We're seeing more and more uh, talking to friends. We have a dog that can't eat chicken, dogs that naturally prey on chicken. Um, we're seeing more and more of these animals that have restricted diets. You want to comment? So. Uh, well, again, it's probably degeneration of their digestive system. Uh, um we, we know that they're in people, so, some people just can't tolerate certain foods. Uh, now, with some people, that is a genuine autoimmune disease, but other things, it's just that their digestive system reacts badly to particular mm -hmm. foods. That could happen in animals as well. If they live out in the uh, wild world, well, they just die. That's survival of the fittest um, or death of the unfit. Uh, so, so again, that that's uh, degeneration and loss. The whole creation yeah. groans until now. <laughs> yes, indeed. Mm. Glenn, you and I were talking at the start of yes. uh, a common belief that scientists have deliberately pushed uh, and increased the amount of gluten in corn and things like that till it becomes a health hazard. And you were saying this is a common myth. Do you want to comment on that? And Diane. And then on what's the real problem here? Is it the corn or is it the people? So, Glenn, over to you. Yeah, so, you know, having had and taken crop breeding classes and having participated in that myself and worked with crop breeders, you know, they are going to breed for traits. So you look back at the Green Revolution, Norman Borlaug's won the, won the Nobel Peace Prize. He was one of 
hours in we <laughs> claim him in crop and soil science. He's one of our famous scientists. Uh, his breeding was not for gluten, increasing gluten. It was for other traits to make the wheat more productive because there were parts of the world that were starving. And it's called the Green Revolution because of the progress made. He made them to where they could be shorter, to where the wheat wouldn't fall over and rot on the ground. He made them more productive. It was tremendous work, but it was not for gluten. And in fact, scientists have done a survey of the wheat that is out there now, and the gluten content has not increased mm. so it's not from the amount of gluten and it's certainly not from breeding for gluten there is no uh, reason to do that it is other reasons and that's what i think diane could probably speak about uh, well we also have to remember that uh, in processed food they actually do extract gluten and then add it yes. to some protest uh, processed food so um, the difference is between what's in the plant as it grows and what's been produced in highly processed food where gluten yeah. is used uh, for for texture and um, for uh, the uh, and the the substance of it um, in the food processing so again that's that's a technology problem it's a human made problem uh, but of course the other thing is um, gluten intolerance there there's two types of that one is uh, true celiac disease is actually an autoimmune disease so again that's our own bodies going downhill uh, in that mm -hmm. um, our immune system or people who have celiac disease their immune system has uh, reacted badly to what is an otherwise natural substance um, and there are a whole lot of these again degeneration and then there are other people whose digestive system does react to gluten but they don't have the true autoimmune disease but it's still a problem so yeah. again degeneration of us um, technology uh, problem in terms of yeah. food processing um, and uh, but uh, what God made was originally very good and in a, in a lot of cases, it still is very good. It's just we've meddled with it or the whole environment or our bodies are going downhill. Joe, would it be time to take our first question break? Yes. I think so. That sounds like a good idea. Just as a reminder to everybody, for some reason, our um, software is not putting all of the live chat through to our uh, screen so we can see it so we're having to uh, do it up on the phone uh, old school style but uh, a few quick thank yous for some people first of all there's a couple of thank yous uh, from doki doki who sent in a couple of donations for uh, 199 but also to uh, douglas bofi for uh, ten dollars and thank you very much for your donations and your support because it is a a great part um of ensuring that we can continue doing these broadcasts and streams we've had quite a few questions that have come in and thank you for everybody who's put the queue uh before the question because it makes it a lot easier for me um diving down through stuff but we have a question here uh, from Henry VIII, no less, uh, who says, some say Genesis 2, verse 5 to 6, teaches that there was no rain until Noah. Others say that there was no <laughs> rain at that time, but there could have been rain between that time and Noah's time. Does it matter either way? Well, I'll throw my uh, six penneth worth uh, using King Henry VIII uh, and his Shakespearean-type language. Um, basically you will find the way the scripture is arranged, it is symphatic in Genesis chapter 2 that a daily mist rose up and watered the earth, right? So get the whole picture. There is a watering system, but it's a daily mist that rises up each morning and waters the whole earth. Now, this is the world that's described as very good. Now, we do a lot of digging on the Darling Downs, and the Darling Downs is a place where you used to have giant kangaroos. We dig them up. Used to have giant wombats, we dig them up. Used to have giant Tasmanian tigers, we dig them up, right? Uh, I did one of my thesis projects at university on a fossil of a Tasmanian tiger found on the Darling Downs. So I don't call them Tasmanian tigers, I call them Queensland tiger migrants. Uh, so that's, that's what we have in the fossil record. But the climate used to be so much better. Now, if I was standing for the next election, 
and I offered the farmers of the Darling Downs a watering system where every morning there'd be no rain, but there'd be mist that watered the whole earth. Vote for me, please. I mm -hmm. would I would be in home and hose with no trouble at all because out there it's black soil plain and if it rains, you're stuck in your, up to your knees in the mud. They don't like the rain. They like the moisture. So they would vote 100% for a world that was watered by mist every day. The plants do much better on mist irrigation. I know I've grown tomatoes or tomatoes, as you Americans say, <laughs> since I was a kid. And if we have a storm, lots of water, but my tomatoes will be dead next day because the big raindrops will bruise the soft leaves and the fungus will get in and they will, they'll be gone. But if I want to water them, greenhouse and mist and those tomatoes, tomatoes will grow right up to 12 metres tall. They become trees. They will develop bark on the outside. So what you see is a diminutive little plant that flowers once a year and dies at the end of the season becomes a fairly permanent tree structure. So the watering system God invented is emphatic, positive. It was a daily mist every day. And then it adds the negative, And there was no rain. Now, if you want to see how long that lasted, when's the next time you read about rain? The answer is Noah's flood. And there's no reference to anything changing between Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 6 and 7. Right now, the, the way you'd normally do forensic analysis of this is you have a positive here, you have a negative. The negative is cancelled when you have the positive statement about rain and obviously that blows the mist out of the window at the same time. So the first rain mentioned in the Bible is in Noah's day. And that's why Peter says Noah believed God not only for righteousness, but he believed him about things which had not as yet been seen. Now, Noah had never seen rain. He'd never seen a flood. He'd never had to build a boat, never had to go to sea. Now, all of those things were what Peter talks about when he says Noah believed God for righteousness and it was about things that had not yet been seen. So that's how important it is. Not only do you have the linguistic evidence, one positive, missed, one negative, no rain, cancel a negative, cancel a positive with a new stuff called rain, then a New Testament comment from Peter, look it up, Noah believed God about things that had not yet been seen and the rest of the world didn't. That always adds the funny side to, to, to the whole thing about Noah's Ark. Hey, guys, I've got a sad message. It's going to rain. Ha, 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 ha. What's rain? Right? It's going to flood. Ha, ha. What's a flood? You know, so that's, that's how much criticism Noah would have had to put up with, yet he believed God in righteousness. Anybody else want to add any comment on that? Yes, uh, that is actually my area of science, Vedos on hydrology. So you may think, well, you know, how is that possible? Well, it's very possible. You know, we're always told water only goes downhill. No, that's not true. Water goes uphill. It goes according to the pressure gradient. So you have a system with a shallow water table. Not only can plants extract water from the ground, but you're going to have an upward gradient constantly supplying this water to a mist. And I've, there's areas in the world today that they get 100% of their water from mist, even today. Mm -hmm. I worked uh, with a fellow scientist, Dale Johnson, uh, in the Smokies, and his research showed that those areas got 30% of their moisture strictly from the mist. Of course, the rest they got from the ground. So how do you have a water table that's shallow enough to constantly be supplying water to the surface to where it every day over the whole earth provide a mist? Well, you remember when, the ground was covered in water, right? And then that water went somewhere. It went below the ground. So, um, Glenn, To add one observation, if you come with me in Australia down to the south coast of New South Wales, there's a little town called Eden. Now, if you are a mad keen hiker, mountain climber, whatever, you can take your family up to the top of the nearby mountain where the council, as a result of the daily mist, is one of the few places in Australia where every morning a mist settles down and the entire mountaintop is covered by cloud 
and it doesn't rain. That's the, they, they've even got a little brochure on it. It doesn't rain here. They, they, it just waters the whole ground by mist and you're walking up in a semi-dry Australian bushland and then it's almost tropical jungle. And what you find is there's a dam at the top filled by mist, right? And the mist condenses, becomes water, there's no rain, and yet there's sufficient daily mist to fill up a dam. It's worth a visit if you come to yeah. Australia. And you notice it says it rises every day because it's rising mm. from that ground below. And then yeah. you think, well, the Bible also says there's rivers, and people have questioned, well, how can you have rivers without rainfall? Well, I can tell you it's called interflow. There is flow through the subsurface. Springs supply these rivers if you've got a shallow water table. And it's also worth pointing out that the meteorologic system that we have today is the result of harsh environments. It's it is not the, result... the one before the exactly. flood. It's, yeah, so rain as we know it is the result of erratic climates. It's the result of extreme climates, which push um, water that's being evaporated in certain ways to come down as rain, very harsh rain, in other places. Yeah. Now, you don't have this in a very good world, and the only real mechanism to kickstart our meteorological system that we understand today is a global flood, which is going to cause erratic climates to push the meteorologic system that we have today. So it makes no sense either um, from, a, from a meteorological perspective to have rain before the flood. If you started off with a mist, that's going to how it's going to stay until you have a mechanism to change it. Joe, I'll add one last comment on this. The last bit of that question was, does it matter? There's two reasons it does matter. A is you are denying the whole picture of scripture, particularly Peter's comment that Noah's belief was so outstanding because he believed God about what he hadn't seen. So hence Noah is in Hebrews chapter 11 as an example of outstanding faith who you and I need to follow. But it matters more because what 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 results is if you say, well, there had to be rain before the flood uh, and then there was rain after the flood, two things go. One is your rainbow doesn't seem to matter much anymore. Yeah. No, secondly, you end up with a philosophy that says whatever rain does now, it's always done. The mm. present is the key to the past, and that's the one thing the Scripture says does not happen. God says through Peter again that in the last days, men will say, hasn't everything continued the same since the beginning? And Peter's answer is no, no, no. So don't fall for the trap of putting what we've got in our present world whether it be rates of radioactive decay, whether it be animals living and dying, whether it be dingoes eating uh, tourists on Fraser Island or Kaggle, as they're calling it these days, the Aboriginal renames, uh, that, that simply is not part of the original good creation. That's why it was so great that you started with the scriptures and you ended with the scriptures because it does matter. Yeah. Okay, maybe a quick question for Diane, because I know we've uh, dealt with this extensively in, in previous streams. So just a very brief comment from you, Diane, um, also from Henry VIII. A book I was reading with my children claimed that the Palmaris Longus was a vestigial. Have we found a use for it yet? Uh, the Palmaris Longus, uh, for, for those of you who are not familiar with that, it's a little muscle in your uh, forearm and uh, it, uh, it, the, the muscle part is actually up here. It has a long tendon that goes into the palm of your hand and then it just sort of spreads out. It doesn't actually connect to a bone. It just connects to the, uh, the connective tissue or the fibrous tissue in the palm of the hand. And what it does, it just tenses that, um, that skin there and it just makes your grip strength uh, a, a a little bit more efficient. Now, it's only a small effect, but it is actually there. Because it's only a small effect, if you don't have a palmaris longus, well, it's uh, not particularly uh, a huge loss, particularly in our world where we spend all our time just twiddling our fingers at computers. Uh, but uh, it, it does have a function. The fact that it is lost is actually an indication of Again, change, but not evolution. It's it's just a degenerative loss, a developmental loss. Um, but it does have a function. 
Okay. Well, thank even you, Diane. Only a small one. Something mm -hmm. I didn't even know I had. Look at that. That's marvellous. And I don't spend half my time twittering on the, on, on computers, but I had a, what did you call it, Palmyra or something or other? Palmaris, as in palm, A-R-S, palm, because oh, the you. tendon of it ends up in the palm of your hand here, uh, blending in with the fibrous tissue of your palm. So if you're hanging on to something really tight, it just tenses that a little bit and increases the efficiency of your grip. Oh, on an object that you're hanging on to, yes. Thank you. Well, That's a new bit of information for me. So great stuff. Um, Joe? If you want an extra bit of trivia, there's also a palmaris brevis, uh, which is in the si side of your hand here, and it also has the same sort of effect, just tensing the, um, the skin on your palm. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's have one last question before we uh, move on to another section of discussions, mm -hmm. um, which uh, I'll ask and then I'll comment on before perhaps um, uh, Diane or Craig can comment on it. Uh, so this is in regards to the shark and the vegetarian sharks. So is the whole thing about shark and blood true or is that a Hollywood thing? And my comment just very briefly is that um, having looked into this before, the uh, certainly a lot of the shark blood no smelling connection has been greatly exaggerated. Um, I think one of the quotes that was out there is that shark can smell a drop of blood from a mile away, and that's not exactly true. And it also, how far they can smell it depends on the species. Um, but I remember reading a report by one marine biologist who pointed out that sharks don't actually smell blood. They're not actually smelling blood when they smell blood. Um, what they're actually smelling are organic molecules. And they can identify and isolate which organic molecules they are to work out which way to hit. Now, if it's organic molecules that they're isolating, well, organic living things or once living things. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's blood. It doesn't matter whether it's, uh, you know, fish remains or rotting fish remains or what else do organic molecules include? Plants. Right. And so I suspect that the original purpose is indeed to smell organic molecules just like it is today. But in today's fallen world where, well, let's think about it. What do we know from the fossil record? Well, it certainly seems that the oceans were a lot more abundant in life um, than they are today. I mean, the open ocean, you can go for hundreds of miles without seeing a, a single creature because there's just nothing to sustain it. Well, it's not surprising because a lot of the ocean floor that we see today, a lot of the continental shelf that we see today dropping down into the abyss is the result of tectonic movement during Noah's flood. I suspect that in an original world where you had one land mass and one water mass, it was significantly different and able to sustain a lot more life. Um, and so you wouldn't need to track down a drop of blood over a mile away, whether they can do that or not. But you're using a good no system to identify organic molecules and work out which way to go for the food. Um, other myths include things like, you know, human blood prefer or preferring human blood over other blood, which isn't true, uh, and, and other things like that. But it's important. I remember it distinctly. It was this um, marine biologist's comment that it was actually organic molecules they were seeking out, not specifically blood. But uh, Diane or Craig or John, any, any other comments? I'll add one true story here. I've often fished for shark out in Moreton Bay, which uh, theoretically has a history of a lot of sharks because they set up a convict a prison on one of our islands. They didn't bother building too many walls. They just fed the sharks. And uh, that was a very good convict-proof escape, you know, positively. You, you wouldn't want to swim to the mainland or even make a little dinghy out of trees or something like that. But having fished, out in the bay very often, particularly as a younger man, I would go fishing for shark and get a bloody bit of meat on my uh, nice hook and uh, throw it out. Now, sometimes you would catch sharks within just a minute or two. Other times you'd never catch any sharks, probably because there weren't any around. No matter how many kilometres away, the blood would be taken with the, uh, with the current. But the most hilarious example was a day I didn't catch a thing but I got near frightened to death because I'm facing back towards the shore. The tide's coming in. I'm throwing out the uh, um, stuff. And then all of a sudden the sky goes black. And then I hear an enormous thwomp as this manta ray, as long as my dinghy, you know, the manta ray with the two big uh, things out the mm. front and big wings, he just jumped over my boat and splashed on the other side. Oh. And I'm pretty sure he did it just for fun. <laughs> I never caught any manta rays, but in reality, it was a glorious event, but a frightening event, 
And I honestly think he was just having fun. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we've got a few more questions that have come through, but let's move on for the time being. and We'll hopefully come back to some questions towards the end. Um, but uh, where are we going next? I believe we've got some okay. more PowerPoint Diane, discussions. Diane does. Diane, remember we had the discussion about what to do next and we raised issues that people have raised over and over again. Did God make a camel for living in a desert? If the world had missed every morning, there couldn't have been any deserts. And this is a popular theme to argue from where the camel is now to what it must have been created for and, and such sort of logic. What have you got to say about these issues? And I believe you've got some slides for us as well. Uh, well, I don't have slides of the uh, the camel, but everyone knows what a camel looks like. The, 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 uh, the, the real point is, are camels designed to live in the desert or can they just survive in the desert? Uh, and they do look like they're designed to live in the desert because they've got long, strong legs. They've got fur uh, for insulation. They've got padded feet. Um, they've even got extra long eyelashes, which uh, help protect their eyes from from sandstorms and dust storms and things like that. Um, uh, <clears throat> the real issue is, uh, were they designed to live in the desert? The fact is they can live in the desert uh, and... Uh, but they can live in the desert and other animals can't. Therefore, they have a sort of monopoly on it, as it were. So this is a classic case of natural selection or survival of the fittest. And we also need to look at what is the world's distribution of, of camels. Well, camels live in Australia, but they, uh, they were brought here by human beings. So the distribution of camels is not just natural, as it were, um, You've also got to put in the, the human factor. But uh, you can go and see camels in places where there aren't deserts. I've seen them in zoos in England and uh, there aren't many deserts there. Um, so it's a matter of camels are able to survive in the desert and they do well because other things don't do well there. And so they have, they've, uh, they've cornered the market, as it were. And human beings have taken advantage of that and have bred them and used them as transport in the desert. Uh, so it is natural selection. That is a real process, but it's not an evolutionary process. It's just a sorting out process. And there's also the human factor um, in that human beings have ob observed this. They've deliberately bred them for uh, these characteristics and enable them to survive. And... Uh, and then they've helped spread them around the world to other environments which were like the environments where they first discovered camels and put them to use. So again, real processes, real biological processes, uh, natural selection, survival of the fittest, and um, real change in that camels now live in Australia, whereas they didn't before human beings brought them there uh, so real change again, but not evolution. Diane, Much more. Yes. Can, can we come comment, back to um, us? Um, yeah, come back to all of us. Yeah. Um, mm. Just on the camel line, a uh, thought occurred to me mm. that many tourists come to Australia to ride on the Garn. Uh, yeah. The Garn is a railway that goes from sort of South Australia right up to the top of Northern Australia. And it's named in honour of those who made the trip first on camel. Right, the mm -hmm. people who bought camels to Australia, the the native uh, camel riders, would were our first roadway right through the Australia in the centre, and the train track follows where they used to go. But it was the camels that we would load up in South Australia, and then they would go all the way through this waterless waste right up Alice Springs and beyond to deliver things. Now you can do the same in air-conditioned luxury with $1,000 uh, cabins and beautiful food, champagne, etc. And uh, it's named in honour of the Garn, the old the old uh, camel train that was there first. Yes, that, that term comes from Afghan, as in, uh, so it's G-H-A. I've been on the Garn. It, it's a fabulous trip. Uh, yes. Uh, but, but yes, it's a, a good example of um, how human beings explain or human intervention explains the distribution of animals uh, and plants all over the world. Uh, so, uh, so yes, camels were designed for the, for the good world. They, they live quite happily 
in places where there's plenty of grass and moisture, but they will survive in the desert. So created for the good world, surviving in the, uh, in the fallen world. Joe. Very good. That's good. Thank you very much. Um, so are there any other comments or things that we've got for discussion or shall we do a few more questions and then begin to uh, mm. begin to wrap it up? Well, I had the oh, I could bring up the giant steam tray oh, if you want to. Oh, of course. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Go yeah. for it. You want to bring up the video? Up video. Yeah. I've got the video. Okay. So um, the video he'll play, you'll be able to see it and read it all. Just a, a comment that because the, uh, the video has been filmed in portrait, which is long ways, and we're obviously broadcasting in landscape, so some of the video will be cut off, but I have watched through it and it is pretty uh, seeable the whole way through but you'll be able to go and find it back on our youtube channel as a short uh, and you'll be able to watch the whole video in hinge so mm. it's about a minute and a half long so let's watch that now and then over to you for comments craig we're in woco national park north of gloucester in new south wales and we're standing in some subtropical rainforest and there's a tree that everyone in this area knows to steer clear of. It's called the giant sting tree. There's some on my right just here. They have a giant leaf and they're incredibly painful to touch. So you want to avoid it if you're bushwalking in this area. But we've got to ask, why would there be a tree like this in a good creative world? Well, the simple answer is it's part of the fall. It's part of the curse. Just check out the size of this leaf. I've got to be really careful I don't touch it because it's very, very painful and you really regret it. All right, there we go. So Craig, over to you for some comments. Yeah, so that's um, the giant singing tree, which occurs right through eastern parts of Australia, uh, up into John's area and, and further north, uh, various species. It's part of the Urticaceae family. And for our northern hemisphere viewers, that's the stinging nettle group. So it's part of the stinging nettle group, but it's a, a lot more painful, apparently. I haven't been stung by the giant stinging tree, thankfully, but I have been stung by stinging nettles, which we do have representatives of down here as well. And um, and they're, they're painful enough, I guess, but I have spoken to people that have been stung by them, the giant stinging tree, and they're very, very painful. So why, why would they have a tree like this in a good created world that can harm people and other creatures as well? Well, what's actually happening is that they've got trichomes on their leaves. Now, trichomes are hairs, and um, you can have hairs on roots, uh, which are called root hairs, uh, and you can have hairs on stems and leaves, and even some plants have them on petals and, and flower parts. But uh, in most plants have them as well, trichomes, but about 30% of plants have glandular trichomes. So these are, um, are hairs that have got glands on them that can exude various oils and things and um, some of them are in fact toxic uh, or painful at, very, at the very least. Now glandular trichomes are widely used across the world for all sorts of things and I've mentioned a couple of those in the video so for fragrances for example essential oils and even in the pharmaceutical industry and some scientists believe that these glandular trichomes have evolved for plant protection to stop the, the plant being eaten, for example, by herbivores. Now, the glandular trichome on the giant stinging tree has a, a, a similar neurotoxin to what you find in spider venom and in uh, cone shell venom. So um, that, that's quite unique for a plant, it seems. Um, what's going on here? Um, it's even known to hospitalise some people, although I couldn't find any reports of people being killed by it. It's a big tree, it can grow to 35 metres. It seems to like to grow in 
disturbed areas. That's why you can find them along the sides of walking tracks, as in the video there. Uh, and the interesting thing with the, the trichome on the leaves of the giant stinging tree is that it has basically a, a sort of injection system. It's almost like it's injecting the venom into you. And uh, th this seems quite a complicated uh, mechanism in it. Um, but uh, it, it can last the pain for uh, months in some people. Now, did the giant stinging tree evolve this or did God create a stinging tree? That could harm people that's the question we we need to honestly ask because in a good world obviously there would be no pain no harmful plants and in fact the bible seems to indicate that all plants were good for food now this is not um something that we would accept as being the case with the giant senior tree that it's a plant that was created as such to sting people so um, what we're seeing in the present is not the key to what was there in the past. Um, now, in this Urticaceae family, a lot of the stinging nettles, and uh, Glenn might like to comment on this, given that his uh, Cajun wife uh, eats most things by the sound of it, um, but <laughs> people do eat stinging nettles and have historically, even in ancient times, um, the ancient Egyptians were known to use stinging nettles for food. And... Um, it's also used for fiber for making ropes for making nets and um and so the stinging nettle group is actually well known uh, even for teas making herbal teas and so on it's also good for and it's got medicinal uses believe it or not it's supposed to be good for arthritis and back pain um it's it it, it can also be used as an antibiotic for dandruff control uh, it can be used for even uh, worms you've got worms in children stinging nettles have been useful for um, what about the giant stingy tree specifically well actually the fruits on the giant stingy tree are edible and it's also able to be used for fiber so it is a useful plant what's going on with this particular plant and I know Diane um, has has comments on this as well we've covered it briefly in a in a, a show some months ago but it seems that as we've been talking about through this show, it's probably uh, through natural selection, it has concentrated some of these um, peptides in, in its production, in its leaf, uh, either through natural selection or genetic mutation potentially. Um, maybe the available soil nutrition can uh, affect some of these uh, developments in a plant as well. Um, and, and natural selection, uh, may have played, played its part as well, but it certainly is a tree that seems, well, it is possible to eat fruits on it, as the Bible talks about, but it's concentrated some of the um, harmful uh, metabolic sort of products in its, in its leaves, and it's only one or two. Apparently, it's only one or two chemicals that are causing all the problems, so slight variations in these things or concentrations of them over time uh, can cause it to be harmful. So any further comments on that, Diane? Uh, yes, going back to the mutations, um, I think this might be one of those areas that we're starting to learn about with the genetic re revolution and we're understanding the regulation of genes. Um, those chemicals were probably there in a small amount um, for those reasons that you've uh, explained about uh, fragrance and uh, about uh, the surface properties of the leaves as part of the, the glandular trichomes. Um, but if the gene regulation goes wrong and these genes are turned on at the wrong time or for too long, uh, you end up with a whole a whole lot more of these uh, these chemicals and they end up being concentrated. So I, I think there's a loss of gene regulation. Uh, and that's probably the case in a, in a lot of poisonous plants. And I think this is an area that needs to be investigated. So for any young biologists who want to investigate things from a creation point of view, uh, I think that's an area that uh, would be very fruitful mm -hmm in terms of finding out uh, so-called poisonous plants are actually just extra concentrations of chemicals that do have another function and they've been turned on at the wrong time or for too long 
or for uh, or too intensely. So it, it might be a gene regulation problem um, of something that does actually have a basic, a good function. Okay, before the Cajun commentator comes on with his little bit of recipes, having run a survival club um, to teach young people how to survive in the wild, yes, we do have nettles cur courtesy of the English, um, but even in England where they are much more abundant, you do eat them, you can make teas as Craig said, you just have to neutralise the poison and most mm. of these organic poisons are neutralised by simple heating the thing in hot water. So if you want to uh, uh, have nettles for use for fibre, make sure you learn where to pick it, where there is no stinging hairs, right down the bottom, there's no stinging hairs. You can pick it, hold it in your hand and dip it in water and then use the fibres. You'll not get stung at all. Or if you like raw spinach, just dip it once and all the fibres will be cancelled and you can actually eat it semi-raw. I'm assuming that's the sort of thing that Cajuns do. Is that correct, Glenn? We eat a lot of things, but... Um... I haven't heard of anyone eating that, but we do know how to season most anything the way it would taste good. <laughs> Very good. Well, uh, if there are any other comments, if not, we'll move on to a few quick questions before we um, carry on. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll make one last one because it's relevant to Jurassic Arc. Our town of Gympie, which is famous for its gold find in the 1860s, which rescued our state from bankruptcy oblivion, is actually named after the singing tree. Its real name is Gimpy Gimpy, big sting, big sting, right? Having been stung by it, I also know from the survival stuff that if you grab the conjuvoy plant, which always grows nearby along waterways and walkways, break it open, the sap will instantly neutralize the sting of the actual stinging tree. So there are native medicines out there which are useful for these things, but that's where the name of Gimpy comes from, this big, um, very painful, it's like lightning combined with fire as it <laughs> goes along your arm. It really is a nasty uh, feeling. Joe, back to you for the questions. Okay, well, we've got a question that's come in from um, Ravi. It's actually a few questions, but they are all around the laws of logic and whether or not the laws of logic are part of God's dominion. And so he says, I'm wondering if God could change the laws of logic, such as the law of non-contradiction, or is God bound by these laws? Can God change the laws of logic? Is that within his power? And what determines God's nature of having the laws of logic that he does and he's kind of put it uh, together into into one question about wanting to know what we think about the origin of the laws of logic are they part of creation or part of god's nature so over to the team for some comments and questions about logic and nature perhaps a good place to start is what logic actually means okay well i'll throw in a starter to get here the laws of logic compiled by man about the way man thinks has nothing to do with god unless you start with God made man in his image and you go from God's revealed wisdom, Ravi, asking questions about human logic compiled by Philo and some of the ancient Greeks will get you nowhere. You need to ask questions that have already been given an answer about wisdom comes from God alone. He never says logic comes from God alone, right? He says wisdom comes from God and you need wisdom with many of the questions you're asking because so often you're hiding behind questions that you know don't even have a human answer in order to avoid the answer that really can't be questioned, who is Jesus Christ, who alone is the way, the truth, and the life. So if you want to know if your logic, which is really a series of sequentially related, consistent thoughts, is valid or not, because you can be totally wrong and yet be logical about it. Agatha Christie is a brilliant example of logical stories that never happen and never will happen, but they're all logical. So logic doesn't have to match reality at all. What you're after, uh, Ravi, is wisdom. So seek Jesus Christ who alone is the way, the truth, and the life. Back to the team. And Well, if it comes down to true or false logic it is true or false that jesus christ rose from the dead is it true or false that he was spoken of in advance uh, by multiple people over thousands of years and fulfilled all those things is it logical that people would die for telling um the truth that he rose from the dead when uh, if it was a lie you know um th those sorts of logic when it comes to 
true or false uh, is the reasons I believe in Jesus Christ because, you know, at, at, to, to initially at least, and then his, um, you know, obviously impact in my life is is very real as well. But um, I think, Ravi, you need to um, apply the same level of scepticism to evolution and atheism because uh, if you do that, you'll you'll come up wanting in far greater way than um, scepticism that you apply to uh, Christianity and Jesus Christ. Okay, we're ready for another question. How did lungfish develop the estivation ability, which is clearly a protective measure to survive in rapidly drying water holes in arid environments? That's a question from Transbluency. And estivation, by the way, for those who don't know, is uh, when lungfish bury themselves in sort of the soft mud and can stick their heads out and start to breathe air, which is where the term lungfish comes from. So um, any comments about that maybe from... Well, I, I find the question interesting because right off he says it's kind of his own logic again the logic is how did the lungfish develop how did the lungfish develop did the lungfish developed or was it created with this ability that's the the dis difference in the question um john any of the others want to follow up on that well i find it interesting like my dam down the backyard is really intriguing because when we get a drought i will catch eels migrating over the land to get into my dam because my dam's got a spring in the bottom now did eels evolve this ability to smell where the water's going to be did they evolve the ability did they develop the knowledge to say hey the water's getting slack down here i better go to john mckay's dam uh, no they either have that ability or they drop dead uh, when they get out of the water and start to migrate. The same is true with all of these features you're talking about. We have fossil lungfish. They show exactly the same structures as our present day lungfish. So all the evidence tells us whatever they've got now, they always have. Then as Christians and creationists, we believe that to be true because God made things to produce their own kind. A better question would be, what would the lungfish do with this in a good world? Perhaps they got out like the eels did and migrated and had a good look around. After all, they're very paddle-like limbs can cope with that. And we have other fishes that in Australia, I don't know if you have them in the USA, but we have fishes that climb trees and take a good look around. I'm serious. You can find them up in the trees, two metres, six feet above the ground, having a look around, and then we find them playing. They'll get up and they'll chase each other and jump off the tree back into the water and you say, how did they evolve that ability? Well, that's an ability you've either got or you die on the way up the tree. So your question's all wrong. Your question indicates your adherence to evolution right from the start in phrasing the question. You need to phrase it. This wonderful ability shows intelligent evidence of design and all the fossils back up that it's always had this, no question. <laughs> Great stuff. Well, um, we've also uh, got a comment from Doki Doki about how much he likes our um, uh, blow up dinosaur outside the church <laughs> sign. I was but wondering if you were going to say that. Well, I thought I'd mention it, Glenn. Why don't you, by the way, if you don't know what we're talking about, go have a look at <laughs> our YouTube channel. We've got a couple of shorts on there. But what is the blow up dinosaur for, Glenn? Well, it's to promote that Indiana Joe is going to be speaking Saturday and Sunday. You've already spoken once, and he's going to have a community wide event Saturday. That's well, tomorrow. tomorrow, our time tomorrow, at uh, 10 o'clock Central Time. It's 10 o'clock in the morning, and we're going to go to a little before noon. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to catch people's attention. Well, we've got a couple of signs out. We've got it's, another one with you good. with another dinosaur, right? right? Yeah, it looks pretty good. Big old big old sign out. So. Yes. So that's going to be in Jamestown at the Highland Church of the Cumberland. So if you're around uh, the sort of uh, East Tennessee area, um, do come along and uh, and see us. And there. it will be live streamed. So you can look for us on YouTube. You can live, We'll be live streaming from Highlands Church of the Cumberlands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Joe, can I throw in a promo just before we finish? about our open day again for the new museum. Go for it. Okay, Creation Discovery Center, 
uh, the brand new dinosaurs, the monsters God may display, and the second story are uh, opening July 29th and 30th. Uh, limited numbers, go to our website, creationresearch.net, not only to find out more information, but to book in. It's a wonderful display, and you'll not only see me, you'll see Craig and Diane. We're all getting together for that fabulous new opening. And uh, Craig, how's your museum in Tasmania going? Yeah, it's pretty quiet uh, at the moment, being in the middle of winter in Tasmania, so we don't get a lot of the tourists, but we're getting a few Tasmanians. Had a, had a few people come through yesterday, which was really good. Yeah. Great stuff. Well, I think it's probably about time that we uh, bring it up to a close. A quick thank you to Lynn Colson uh, for a $25 donation. We really do appreciate that. And for everybody who's donated this evening, we uh, thank you because it really does help us to keep these programs coming. We'll be back again, of course, next week, uh, where hopefully the live chat will work on our software. It's probably about time we think about upgrading the software a little bit. But uh, thank you to all those who commented on the live chat. We were able to obviously pull it up in front of us on our phones. And for all the questions as well there's one or two questions we haven't got uh, got to but uh, as we said we keep hold of all the questions and yes for the person who asked the question about the origin or the real purpose or the original purpose of the bombardier beetle which was a question which was put on a comment on the video after we'd broadcast it yes we do pay attention and sometimes we even build our um, creation conversations around them but we've been having a, uh, a good uh, discussion amongst the team with regards to creation conversations and some of the topics going forward and some of the programs and the way that it's going to look. So do keep uh, the whole team in prayer as we uh, look to continue creation conversations and develop uh, amongst all the other live programs that we do and videos that go up and everything else as well. But until next time, we'll be back next week. Until next time, do continue to support and pray for us. Do continue to like and subscribe and share the information around. Go and see the Australian Museum in Queensland. If you can make it, go and see Craig's Museum in Tasmania. Come and see me at the Highlands Church of the Cumberlands in Jamestown over the next couple of days and uh, continue to let us know because, uh, Glenn, we've, I'm going to be back at some point, I should think. In October. In October. So We're if you're listening in schedule. the States, it's Glenn who you want to get in touch with. There'll be details on the new Creation Research USA website, creationresearchusa.org, and you'll be able to get in touch with Glenn there and contact him about organizing ministry in the United States. So until next time, folks, goodbye and good bless. Any last words from the team? Nope. Good night. Good night. Good night. We'll see you soon. You too.